we sing our opening hymn, All Glory, Lord and Honour. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. With those words, I welcome you to our Palm Sunday uh, Parish Communion. It's uh, good to see you here in the church and also good to welcome those who are joining us uh, online. Those who are in the church, you should have been given a, a palm cross as you came in. Uh, if anybody hasn't got one, um, they're up there at the back of the church. So uh, you will need these in a minute. So the first part of the service this morning is slightly different to our normal service as we have our palm liturgy. 
I invite you to sit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, during Lent we have been preparing by works of love and self-sacrifice for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today we come together to begin this solemn celebration in union with the Church throughout the world. Christ enters his own city to complete his work as our Saviour, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. So let us go with him in faith and love, that united with him in his sufferings, we may share his risen life. I invite you to hold up your palm crosses as I bless them. God our Saviour, who entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die, let these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to gather the nations into the peace of your kingdom. Lord, have mercy. You come in word and sacrament to strengthen us in holiness. Christ, have mercy. You will come in glory with salvation for your people. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. I invite you to join with me in saying the collect for today. True and humble King, hailed by the crowds as Messiah, grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way to the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. We now have our first reading, which Sue is going to read for us. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to sing our gradual hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty.
remain standing for the gospel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. John chapter 12, the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, Daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. I preach faithfully in the name of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you once again. John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. I wonder if you're the sort of person that likes festivals and parades, because both are on offer in our Palm Sunday passage this morning. Who likes a parade? Stick up a hand if you like a parade. I've been in the Lord Mayor's show twice. I can assure you a lot of people love a parade. They're very exciting. Well, a huge crowd's come from all over the Middle East. They are nearing the end of their long pilgrim journey with all its privations. They're camping out in all the surrounding villages and they're going to travel this final stretch with Jesus himself, no less, to enter the theological Glastonbury of Jerusalem. And they're hyped up and they're ready to have a great time. And a parade is started for this final triumphant bit of the journey. Almost everyone loves a parade. It gets the blood going. But alas, when we finish waving our palm branches triumphantly in the air and pinning them to our notice boards for another year, what then? After the Lord Mayor's show comes, shall we say, the dust cart. And the dust cart in this case alas, represents darkness indeed. I think we're sometimes deceived by the donkeys in the Bible because they are so cute. We sing little donkey at Christmas time. We borrow a donkey if we can for Palm Sunday, and there's nothing wrong with that. They are symbolic of peace. Jesus chooses them deliberately to diffuse the political tinderbox of the crowd, and that's fine as far as it goes. But I wonder. The trouble with donkeys is that they are also symbolic of light turning to dark very quickly in Bible passages. Donkeys can be deceptive in that way. A very different donkey rider, a lone gunman, rides into a Mexican border town in 1964. The local gangsters, looking for fun, fire their guns at the feet of the mule who bucks and shies. The lone gunman keeps his cool. He explains that he understands that the thugs are just having a bit of fun. But the mule, he just doesn't get it and needs an apology. The thugs laugh harder. It's a big mistake. And then he says this, I don't think it's nice you laughing. You see, my mule don't like people laughing. He gets the crazy idea you're laughing at him. Now, if you boys were to apologise like I know you're going to, I might convince him that you didn't really mean it. Well, if you've seen the film, A Fistful of Dollars, you'll probably know what happens next. Laughter turns to darkness very quickly, and the old wizened village coffin maker cackles and rubs his hands and gets to work. 
And in a sort of way, that's exactly what's happening in these chapters of John. The donkey so central to our passage foreshadows the murder of Jesus Christ. Look at the backdrop with me, if you will. The crowd are hyped up and excited and laughing, but the Pharisees aren't. The triumphal entry is shadowed by their political machinations as they plot and plan to kill Jesus. Why? What's got the temple church wardens and the treasurer and the entire Sanhedrin PCC so riled up that they want to kill Jesus? It's a good question. I used to have a history teacher when I was in the first form called Mr. Bell. He had been gassed in the First World War, and he was a huge man, towering over us, ancient, threatening, and psychotic. As 11-year-olds still learning the ropes of a new school, we were terrified. And in a typical history lesson, he would say in his sonorous voice, history is not all about the type of socks they wore and the type of food they ate and all that rubbish. It's about war. And he would pick on someone in the front row and ask them to repeat what history was all about. And woe betide the stammering schoolboy who gave the wrong answer. But the psychotic Mr. Bell had a point. History, even modern history, that is being written in our newspapers daily is all about who possesses and controls the land. And things were exactly the same in those days. Go back just a few short verses into John 11. The chief priests and the Pharisees call a meeting of the council and say, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. The crowds are following him. He's leading them astray. Define astray. What they mean is, of course, astray from us. If we let him go on like this, everyone will start to believe in him. Well, that's not so bad, everyone believing in Jesus Christ, but they clearly aren't so keen on the idea. And it doesn't take much reading between the lines to figure out that their overriding concern is not national or religious, but personal. If everyone follows Jesus, that will destroy the status quo by which we, the Sanhedrin, have power and privilege within a state controlled by the Romans. Worse, when they make Jesus king, the Romans will come and destroy everything. At that point, we will be tarred with the same brush. And we also will be swept aside when the insurrection is put down. We will lose everything, possibly even our lives. That's what the Pharisees are thinking. They may be the guardians of the tradition of the church and of faith in God, but actually, in the end, all they're trying to do is save their own sorry skins. And so a plan is formed. We need to stop being squeamish. We need to kill Jesus to save all the rest. The rest, the rest, by the way, that got swept away anyway uh, by the Romans just a few short le years later. That's the result of their short-term expediency. And that's exactly the same conversation that recurs after the triumphal entry in our chapter, chapter 12. The triumphal entry of Jesus is sandwiched in between their machinations. Chapter 12, verse 19, the whole world has gone after him. This is getting us nowhere. What is getting them nowhere? Well, their strategy of confronting Jesus and challenging his teaching and trying to discredit him with the people, all that is getting them nowhere. Instead, the miracles are piling up, including Lazarus of all people, that lightning rod of miracles, the raising of the dead. They will make Jesus king. That's what Hosanna, by the way, really means. If you read Psalm 118, and I really hope you will, go home and read Psalm 118 if you, if you possibly can. Hosanna does not mean glory to God. It means God save us. And with Roman tanks thundering down the road every day and Roman checkpoints at every street corner and Roman taxes to pay every five minutes, it's not difficult to understand exactly what they wanted saving from. Hosanna, it's a demand. God save us now. 
A popular uprising against the Romans is only around the corner. Jesus has to be sacrificed by this logic. I think we've all met this in real life, alas. The danger of promoting people with small vision to positions of power always ends badly. When expediency takes over from morality, bad things always start to happen. Bad decisions will get rubber stamped by the committee if the voices of the powerful are not to be challenged. We have all, I suspect, been there. The timid ones don't speak up and disaster awaits. Open our newspapers or even our church times and you will see the results time and again. This Palm Sunday, I wonder what land and power and status we foolishly try to cling on to. The challenge, it seems to me, is the same as in John 12. The church should glorify the living Christ and not serve itself or ourselves. Of course we love our church buildings and our history and our theology and our tradition. We love our artwork and our culture. And they are wonderful things, but they should all be to glorify Christ. When and if we get to the point where they are not doing so and we start to glorify things for their own sake, valuable and wonderful though they are, then things will not end well. The challenge to myself and to all of us this Easter is to choose the right agenda. The Pharisees have chosen the wrong agenda. It is the politics of power exercised by small people. The crowd, curiously, have also chosen the wrong agenda. They are quoting Psalm 118, God save us now. It is an imperative. It is a demand for the defeat of enemies. They are not worshiping Christ. Not as such, they're demanding a revolution against the Romans, and they want it now. It's the wrong agenda, and that also will end in tears, and so it did. And the right agenda? We worship Christ. His kingdom is not of this world. We can travel with him through Easter, as indeed he travels with us. We can talk to him, we can ask for his help. And if we are wise, we can make time to hear his replies. Come with me, if you will, and let's look at the donkey in a new way. Instead of shouting out our own plans and desires, let's walk alongside Christ in gentleness and in humility and lay our own plans aside and listen to what he has to say. Because when we cast aside the cloaks of our own agendas and lay them at his feet and walk with him in that humility, we will surely experience wonder. Amen. Our choir anthem this morning is a setting of the words Hosanna to the Son of David. The music is by Peter Aston, and he sets it in a minor key, which gives that sense of threat and menace that Rutten has been alluding to. This is not uh, praise and glory to God. This is a demand for revolution.
we stand to affirm our, word, our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to sit or kneel for our prayers of intercession. response today is to the bidding, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself and became as nothing for our redemption. Give to your church the servant mind to display your grace and mercy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer today, we pray for the Church of the Province of West Africa. And in the diocese, we pray for Archdeacon Catherine as she settles into her new role as Archdeacon of Surrey. And in the parish, we pray for our 11 candidates who will be confirmed and some of them baptized here on Saturday evening, on Easter Eve. we bow the knee to confess your name. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord Jesus Christ, on this day the crowd shouted praises, but in just a few days they turned on you. We pray for all who are at the mercy of fickle popularity. We pray for the suffering people of the world, especially those living in war zones, for the people of Russia and Ukraine, the people of Israel and Palestine, and so many other places across the world. Give governments strength and courage to hold what is true and right. Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord Jesus Christ, as the crowd spread their cloaks and waved trees, we give thanks for the occasions that fill us with joy at being alive. We thank you for this spring season, for the spring flowers and for the lengthening days. And in our local community today, we pray for those who live in Bridge Road and Hesketh Close. Draw us closer to one another and to you. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord Jesus Christ, in your passion we see our human frailty. Be with all whose endurance is strained 
and spirit is weakened by their ailments. We pray especially today for Jane Bloss, Pam Cheeseman, Claire Curry, Anne Dully, Trisha Hislop, Sandra Keeping, David Latimer, Louise, Gladys Mully, Alan Page, Peter Poole, Diana Trent, and Jeremy Watts. Sustain the weary with your eternal word. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Lord Jesus Christ, you shared your life even to the point of death. Gather to yourself in gentleness and peace all who have died. And especially at this time, we commend to your care and keeping the souls of Leslie Minard and Bishop Michael Adey, the former Bishop of Guildford, whose funeral takes place tomorrow in our cathedral church. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest name. And as we begin our Holy Week journey to walk with you the way that leads to the cross and the way that leads to resurrection and eternal life. Just as you are highly exalted, so may we come to share your eternal kingdom. Amen. You have a Sunday notice sheet, I hope, either in the paper form or in the uh, electronic form that was sent out. Obviously, there is a lot happening this week, and you have an opportunity to share in that in all of the worship that we have in our church, which you can find both on the front page of the notice sheet and in the poster that's in the village and on the penultimate page in the notice sheet. Just a couple of things to particularly draw your attention to. Uh, on Thursday evening, we join um, together to uh, commemorate the Last Supper and the feet washing. And this is an important part of the journey. That's at 6 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, on Good Friday, there is a choice of worship opportunities a morning prayer here in church, the walk of witness and the service in Stockland Square, and the three-hour service of devotion, uh, which, as the notices tell you, uh, I will be leading this year and exploring um, Good Friday through the eyes of St. John's Gospel. The three-hour service is a sort of sandwich. Um, I will be um, teaching from St. John's Gospel in the first and third hours, and the middle hour will be um, a time of reflecting in music and in poetry. You are very welcome to stay for the whole three hours or to join or leave at any point that you want to during the service. And then, of course, we have this year this uh, special occasion. I think for the first time, uh, certainly uh, in, in living memory, um, we are going to have a uh, full immersion baptism service here in church, confirmation, the Easter rites, and celebrate the resurrection in a very special way uh, with Bishop Peter presiding um, and our um, 11 candidates, that's uh, five young people and six adults being, uh, some of them baptized, some of them uh, confirmed, uh, and we will be joined by four candidates from Ewhurst Church as well. So that's a really special occasion and um, as they say uh, in certain circles, be there or be square. It means I'm encouraging you to come in case you don't know the lingo. And there, of course, our services on Easter Day, which I need no uh, introduction. Uh, one other thing just to remind you of, that tonight um, our choir will join the choir from St. James Shear. We've, um, we've got a little thing going that once a year they join us here, and once a year we join them uh, over there, and tonight we will be joining them 
for a service of words and music for Holy Week. Um, you're very welcome to, to come for that. Um, just beware that the service is at 6.30, not 6 o'clock that we normally have our services here in Cranley. Right, um, I've talked enough apart from to say a huge thank you to those uh, who came for the church spring clean uh, yesterday. You should notice that the church is looking uh, super duper shiny and, uh, and clean. Um, so a huge thank you to the uh, dozen or so people who turned up for that. We have just one more notice this morning. Um, we have this week uh, the excellent news that our church has been awarded a, a bronze certificate as, uh, as an eco-church. So that means we still have two stages to go, which are unsurprisingly silver and gold. Um, and Sue, uh, who is spearheading our eco-church initiative, has got the... Sue, would you like to bring the certificate out? Um, people can see it afterwards. Um, and can, we, can we hold it up so that um, we can see it on the, on the live stream as well? This is what it looks like. Oh, there we go. Um, sorry. Oh! <laughs> you got it. This is fun. <laughs> there we go. So um, that's absolutely excellent. It's, uh, Sue, Sue, you've done a lot of work on this, um, and the PCC have been working on it as well. Um, and Sue, do you want to say anything? Or? I'll say just a couple Do you want to come on the microphone? Um, well, it's wonderful to have the award from A. Rocha, which, as you probably know, is a, is a global charity supporting churches such as ours to look after God's creation. And I think, Roy, it's really a wonderful acknowledgement of a, of a team effort of all of those within the congregation who look after both our land, our buildings, um, those involved in worship and teaching about God's creation and how we look after it. And uh, as you say, uh, this is the start of the journey, and I have a few ideas um, that we'll talk to you all about how we progress on to, to silver and, and beyond um, in the coming months. But uh, thank you to everyone who's part of that team that's led to the award. Thank you. So thank you very much. It is worth just um, noting what it actually says on here, which it says, um, we have won a, bro a bronze Eco Church Award in recognition of our efforts to care for God's earth in each of the following areas, worship and teaching, management of buildings and land, community and global engagement, and lifestyle. Now, um, if that makes any of you feel a little bit guilty, perhaps you might like to, uh, uh, to think about it, reflect on it, and pray on it, uh, and then we might get to silver sometime next year. That's excellent. So, have we decided where we're going to put this, or is it still work in progress? Okay, right. For now, it's going to sit on the organ console, so if you could rescue it afterwards. Excellent. Let's stand for the piece. Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We offer one another a sign of peace. And peace to those of you at home. Uh, our offertory hymn is From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe, the Servant King.
The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and singing. How wonderful the work of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced her people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms for us on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you, gave you thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ, and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last with St. Nicholas and all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise.
we sit or kneel to pray. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And we stand to sing our final hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. There was one notice that didn't make it onto our Sunday notice sheet today, uh, and I forgot to mention it as well when I did the uh, notices. Uh, being the 24th of the month today, uh, we do have prayers for the Ukraine at the village flagpole at 12 o'clock, and you're very uh, welcomely invited to come and join that. And so now, as we take our worship from this church and into our Holy Week, I invite you to join with me in saying these responses from the Iona community. The cross, we will take it. The bread, we will break it. The pain, we will bear it. The joy, we will share it. The gospel, we will live it. The love, we will give it. The light, we will cherish it. The darkness, God shall perish it. Christ crucified, draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith and a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.